Welcome to the Bean Ninjas podcast, where you get an all-access pass to see what happens behind the closed doors of a fast-growing global bookkeeping and financial reporting business. In this episode of the Bean Ninjas podcast, I speak with co-founder and current CEO, Meryl Johnston, about her first three years in business. In July of 2018, this year, she celebrated three full years at Bean Ninjas, and in recent episodes, we've dif- we've taken a deep dive into her seven-day launch, her first eight months, her journey to her first 100000 and weathering the split when her co-founder left the company. So now on this episode, I really just wanted to kind of get information from her about the first three years on on a whole, what it was like for her looking back, um, some of the highs and lows, although I got to say, you know, at Bean Ninjas, it's been far more highs than lows. And of course, their growth as an international company in just three years is perfect evidence of that. So we're going to go into some details. Uh, We're going to talk about winning the Zero Bookkeeping Partner of the Year Award in 2017. So before they even made it to their third full year in business, they were winning awards from zero, which is pretty fantastic. We're going to talk about attending the DCBKK, hosting the DCX with her former co-founder, Ben, and changing to remain successful. And that part is where we go into her vision of the future, what she thinks Bean Ninjas is going to have to do to survive and to continue to be the innovative mega force that they are. So let's jump right into the episode now and see what Meryl has to say. Welcome back to the Bean Ninjas podcast. I am your co-host, Elizabeth Powers, joined again with Meryl Johnston. How are you, Meryl? I'm good, thanks. Tell me. Yeah, go ahead. Now, I was just going to say, what has your week been like? Um, We have a lot of really cool stuff to talk about on this episode, but I want to hear a little bit about your week. What have you been up to? It's been a big week in, well, more in my personal life than for Bean Ninjas, but I'm actually a homeowner so we, my partner and I Yay. have bought our first home nice congratulations now I'm assuming it's close to the water <laughs> that was one of the criteria I I worked it out on google maps before we were looking at the property and it's it's a little bit further it's not 500 meters anymore but it's less than 10 minutes it's about seven or eight minutes to my local surf spot still short enough that you can get there for your 5 a.m. surf and now in my mind because I'm dreaming of this house that you've just bought in my mind it has like a top of the line yoga studio somewhere in there (laughs) there's actually an area so there's a lovely deck out the front that would that has nice views of the of the countryside and so that is a nice yoga it could be a nice spot for yoga but there's also an area out the back that we're talking about that might also be nice for, as a little yoga studio so we haven't got that figured out yet awesome but you've got options so that's great so you can get to the beach and you have more than one place to do yoga so that sounds like a good buy for you congratulations that's really exciting have you been like going to all the home stores and buying all the knickknacks and things like that to, to decorate have you started down that path yet we haven't yet. We've got a little bit of re- some renovations to do with painting and getting the floorboards polished. So we can't move in or can't take anything into the property yet. So we're waiting until that's done. And then then I think we might be doing a little bit of shopping. Excellent. I'm going to keep up with you on these renovations because in my experience, that's one of those things that once you start, you never actually finished. There's always something else you want to do. So I'm, I'm curious to see uh, how long these renovations end up going for you. But congratulations. That's really cool. Yeah, thank you. We are going to talk today on the podcast, kind of getting a little into the business side of your life. Um, we're going to talk about your a three-year review. So, oh, another big uh, milestone you just hit, which is Bean Ninjas just turned three years old, right? Yeah, it's very easy to remember the Bean Ninjas birthday because it's the 1st of July, which is also the first day of the Australian financial year. So we're never going to forget that. You are, you are never, no matter how much you would like to, you never get to forget that day. <laughs> no. Excellent. So three strong years. Every year you've grown. 
And, you know, they say if you can make it the first five years, you're doing well. And, of course, the ninjas shows no signs of stopping um, or slowing down. So I want to go through that timeline. Um, now, last episode, we talked about the breakup, which was you and your co-founder, Ben, decided to part ways um, just around about the one-year mark. Is that right? It was actually about the 18 18- 18 months into the business, yeah. Okay, 18 months in, you're growing, things are going well, you've got a good team of people that are working with you, you started to see um, just some differences um, in where you both wanted the business to go, Ben had a family, you were both at that time unbelievably still working other full-time jobs. So just some, you know, dividing that had to be done, and you make it through the breakup, you uh, are now alone at the helm of Bean Ninjas, and then you go through a rough patch where some things were just, you know, needed to be redone. You had some uh, clients, you know, the pricing needed to be adjusted. A number of things went on, so you got through that point. And then tell me a little bit about what happens then, because you've had some really exciting stuff happen, especially for such a young company. Um, so talk me a little bit past that. You know, you've, you're about three to four months out from from uh, Ben leaving. So you're approaching the two-year mark and tell me about what's going on at that point. So there's there's a couple of things that have been happening. One is that we've moved into an office space. So previously I had worked out of co-working spaces. I'd rotated between co-working spaces and then working from home and then going back into a co-working space. And our team was that we had got some Gold Coast Pace team members and I thought it was important that we could work together. And so we moved into a shared working space with the guys at Black Hops Brewery. We're really lucky. They brew downstairs and they have office space upstairs and they didn't need all of the office space. And so I was able to move in there with the Beanages team where I've got a, a private office. So if I'm working on something that I need to focus, I can be in there. And then there's a co-working area where the team can sit and collaborate together and also focus on their their work as well. And that felt like quite a big step for us, Yeah, having previously not had a space where we could come together. And, and when we do have team members from interstate or overseas, we actually now had somewhere where they could come and work too. And so I think it kind of bears repeating. We're talking about the two-year mark before you are in a space where you can kind of have your own office and close the door, right? Yes. So in co-working spaces, sometimes I was hot desking and there were periods where I did have an office where I could I could shut my door, but it wasn't where the, the team could sit or we could have team conversations because I was still sharing the office with someone else. I didn't have a private office. Amazing. So that's like March 2017, right about in that time frame. And then it wasn't too long after that that you actually got an award. Tell me about the award that you got from Zero. So this is an award that we'd been we'd had our eye on and been really striving to win from really when when we started the business and became zero partners and were aware of ZeroCon, which is the annual zero conference and the awards that that are announced as part of that event. And so we had really decided that we would love to win the zero bookkeeping partner of the year award. And as a new business, we weren't sure, really sure what our chances would be, but put a lot of effort into that application. And also we've been growing the business, but we'd also been creating interesting stories about the way that we were doing things. And I think that helped the award application. And at ZeroCon 2017, we were announced as Zero Bookkeeping Partners of the Year for, for the Queensland region. And it just felt incredible. Absolutely. Had any? How old are typical? Are the usual winners? Are they normally companies quite as young as yours? Not usually. There, there's so there's some bookkeeping businesses that are very well established and might be twenty years old or or older. Sure. And there's there's up and comers too that might be three or five years old, maybe a little bit older. But I think it's unusual that a business that was only just over two years old would win an award like that just because it takes a while to get a business organized and create all of your systems and, and build a team. So Absolutely. yeah, we were, we were stoked. Absolutely. Well, congratulations again on that. And then at the same time, you were also doing some international growth, right? Yes. Yeah, so soon after ZeroCon in October, 
I'm, there's a conference called DCBKK, which is in Bangkok, and that's part of. I'm part of a group called Dynamite Circle, and they have a, an annual conference in Bangkok. So soon after ZeroCon, we're on a high. I flew over to Thailand for that conference, and also flew out Tom, who works. He's based in Manchester, and so he runs our European operations. So he came out and met me at that conference, and then also came back to the Gold Coast afterwards to work with some others in the team. And at the same time, we also had Michael, who lived in Sydney, drive up and, and spend a month on the Gold Coast. And that was just such a great opportunity for the team to spend time together in person, and as well as sitting next to each other, where they learn so much, just seeing the way that each other are doing things, we're able to do a lot of social things too. Absolutely. And then round about the end of 2017, you were doing some uh, raising capital. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so after the buying out Ben, I didn't think that I would have – I thought I was done with business partners. <laughs> and then I was actually I'm – I'm in a couple of different mastermind groups, and one in particular is actually where the investor – Simon came from and I'd been talking about the the growth plans that I had for he'd, six months he'd probably been hearing about them but I was constrained by either it was either going to take more of my time and I was already working long hours mm -hmm. or money to invest in some of these things and grow faster and so he actually approached me with the suggestion of because he was he was actually looking to invest in different businesses he's already as has a successful business and was looking to get into investing. And so I was really lucky that that opportunity came up and then we were able to talk through that and I was able to map out a plan of what I thought it would cost to achieve the, the business growth goals that we had. And then he he could he was yeah happy to come on board and invest in beanages, which was, was really exciting, but it was also a whole process as well. I needed to, it was quite different to having a business partner that works in the business. This was a, a different relationship where Simon would be a mentor for me and invest money into the business, but I would still have decision-making ability over everything with the day-to-day. -day. And so there was a lot of learning involved in setting up an investment deal like that and how we we're going to structure it and whether Simon was going to be on the board of directors. There was a whole lot of different decisions and I did a lot of reading and learning about investing yeah. during that period. And how has it affected, tell me about some of the change that, that you've been able to see in the business just as a result of that. It's, it's been amazing. It's taken, the so with things like working capital, previously that was my bank balance that was funding things if we needed, right. if we wanted to spend more on something else. That was coming out of my personal bank account. And so that meant that I couldn't take risks. Oh, I had to be mindful of how much of my own money was already tied up in beanages separate to my personal finances. And it also meant that I couldn't do things like create a podcast or create an online course until we'd earned that money. Mm -hmm. And then in order to earn that money, I needed to help the team or bring on more new clients. So it just slowed everything down. Whereas when investment comes in, then it took the pressure off me needing to earn that money before we could spend on some of the things like the podcast or the online course or improving our website. And speaking of taking the pressure off, it, I think it also kind of played a part in, I think it was January of 2018 this year, you finally were able to take some time off, which is like, oh my goodness, it took over two years for you to get an actual vacation. But to me, the most shocking part was that you took the time off and didn't check emails. My first thought is, OMG, panic attack. <laughs> how how did you do that? I mean, you must have had complete confidence in the team that you'd had in place at that point in time to be able to do that. How difficult was it to take a whole, you know, week or so off and not check a single email? Did you really not check that one? Uh, I, th I think so. Because I've been planning for it. I'd not really, had, in the early days of the business, I'd been, I I'd had taken a holiday while Ben was taking care of things and the internet wasn't great. So I'd, I still was working because I was writing, mm -hmm. but I wasn't involved in emails. But 
after he left, then it was very difficult for me to take time off because there was still a lot of things I was involved in in the business. And I knew that I needed a break. You need more than just a weekend to recharge. Absolutely. And between Christmas and New Year, that's quite a slow time in Australia business-wise. So it seemed like the perfect time to take a break, but I had to plan it. So we had to, I let everyone know that I was not going to be available and we actually had people on rotation in the team checking. I didn't want anyone else to have to work then either, but we were – people volunteered to just, just to, to check the company email. We're lucky because everyone has access to it to check it just one day each during that period. So I knew that email was being checked and that things were being looked after and that we had an autoresponder to set expectations. And we'd also let clients know early that the team was taking a holiday during that period. And it really helped me to recharge and actually switch off from business and come back refreshed. And now we're actually being a lot more proactive about everyone in the team having holidays and then not being on email or checking anything work-related when they are on holiday so they can come back and recharge, come back recharged and refreshed. I absolutely love that. And I hear there's starting to be a shift, I think, with um, executive teams and companies are starting to realize that you really do need your team, everyone, whether you're the owner or, you know, the newest employee, when they've earned that time off, you really do need them to take it and be completely off work. Like you said, it does really reset it hits a reset button and allows you to recharge and i know that bean ninjas is a really family oriented company uh and so i think it's great that you're setting that example and and you're able to do it i i don't know that i would i would probably check a couple of times just to tell myself not to panic so (laughs) you did better than i would do Uh, but it was perfect because you mentioned in the last uh, episode that you did in fact get a chance in march to run a conference with your original co-founder so tell me a little bit about the dc conference so the, there's a big conference which is in Bangkok in October and that has about 300 people. And then there's smaller events called DCX events that are held all around the world and they're run by members of the community. And there hadn't been an Australian event, well, not since I've been a part of Dynamite Circle. And Ben always loved his trips up to the Gold Coast when we were working together. And so it's actually his idea that we run a, a conference on the Gold Coast or the, the DCX event. And so Ben was driving it, but because I live here, I got on board to help with things like finding a venue and f- finding event spaces for different evening activities and things, organizing things like surfing lessons for everyone. And so we actually had a great time organizing that event together. And ho- I'm hoping, I'm, I'm gradually trying to encourage other entrepreneurs to move to the Gold Coast. So now that 30 have had a taste for the good weather and the beaches and good food, then I'm hoping to see more people move here. Hey, let me know when you're trying to get some podcast hosts to move to the Gold Coast. (laughs) (laughs) You did. You've had a couple of events actually this year because also in March you had the Keepers Collective Retreat and the Commonwealth Games. I'm not familiar with either one of those, so tell me a little bit about them. So the Keepers Collective, that's another mastermind group that I'm in. And Keepers, that comes from bookkeepers. And so that's a group of people who run bookkeeping businesses in Australia and we're all in different states spread out around the country. We meet online. We do a Zoom meeting every fortnight, but we also try and meet in person for a weekend retreat a couple of times a year. So in March, we travelled to a little countryside location near Sydney and met together to work on our businesses. And we we had different people within the group run sessions on different topics. I think I was running one, I run one on marketing and we all, all different topics that relate to our business growth. And also we, we look at our goals and what we're, what we're aiming for and try and keep each other accountable. So that was another, another really great event in March and then the Commonwealth Games that was that's Commonwealth countries that compare it's like the Olympics but for Commonwealth com- countries that was actually on the Gold Coast in April oh, and so awesome. I actually took some more t- yeah some more time off work which again it's been challenging for me to take holidays for the last three years but mm. I actually again blocked out my calendar and made space and we went along to about six different events and I love watching sport and 
to have an event like the Commonwealth Games in my city on in the Gold Coast, I wanted to make sure that I took advantage of that. Absolutely. That is so cool. I've never been to anything like that. The closest I came was like a Super Bowl, but that's not nearly as cool. <laughs> and then I want to get into some of the biggest things you've learned in the last few years, but I, I don't want to move past kind of your timeline of what's been going on lately without talking about the first Bean Ninja baby. Yes. <laughs> so our, our operations manager, Fiona, was, is the first Bean Ninja or team member to actually give birth to a baby since we've had the business. So we, we have other team members who have families wayne for example who's in our u.s office he has five kids oh wow but yeah but none of, we'll, have, we'll have to get him on to have a chat about how he balances that he's actually yeah. on a road trip across the the states at the moment as we speak wow but, with five kids yes five wow. kids he's a braver yeah. person than i am <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, so Fiona's recently given birth to her little boy Yogi, and oh, we, we that's such a cute name. Yeah, and they came for an office visit recently, and he was decked out in his Zero gear. So Zero is the accounting software that we use. Had oh. sent over, they've got baby outfits, and so he was decked out in his Zero baby clothes, oh, and it was just the cutest thing ever. That's so cute. We're gonna have to post some pictures so that people can <laughs> yes. see Yogi. That's adorable. So I want to talk a little bit about um, some of your biggest lessons in the first three years. I know uh, you'd mentioned before that choosing a niche is really important. Can you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, I think if I was looking back at something that we did or that I'm glad that we've done, it was finding finding a niche. And when we first started, we didn't do that. We, we provided bookkeeping services to all different kinds of businesses, tradesmen, hospitality, online businesses. And then we once we had figured out our niche, which is online businesses, and there's still different market segments within that, like people developing software, digital agencies, people, e-commerce sellers. But by doing that and at least narrowing down to online businesses, it, it helped with everything. So it helped with our marketing because now we're talking to a clear audience and we can use language that talks directly to them and we can, our, cop, our, our writing or our copy is related to talking about the pain points for them that we're solving. And so I think that our audience, when they, they're reading or looking at our content, it feels like it is talking, it feels like it's aimed at them, which I think is important. Absolutely. But not only from a, not only from a marketing point of view, the actual service delivery side of the business, once we're, we're serving a smaller market, we can create systems that are more repeatable. So if you're doing bookkeeping for a hospitality business, the way that you do that bookkeeping, the zero add-ons that you need to learn are very different to if you're serving someone who's selling on Shopify. And by narrowing down the market that we're serving, we're able to create better systems to serve our specific customers better. The, the third area that I think relates to a niche is getting the team on board with a vision. So if they're really clear about the customers that you're trying to serve and what the longer-term vision for the business is, then it gives them something to get on board and get behind too. I love that. And, you know, it's funny because the more the Internet sort of makes the world a small space and everyone can, you know, find and interact and, and access just about anything they want, it also then kind of comes full circle and requires that businesses do become more niche and, and that people are able to find a company whose messaging speaks to them in their specific space and where they are in their journey as a potential customer or existing customer of yours. And so that's a lesson that I think we're hearing more and more of is that specializing um, definitely will lead you to better growth and better spend on your marketing dollars. And speaking of marketing, you've said something before, um, I think just in chatting uh, with me offline, is how you've put a focus on valuing your reputation and something you said that I think may sound a little controversial at first is that Facebook ads didn't work for you. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So the, the first time that we tried Facebook ads and, and we haven't actually tried it since, not to say that we'll never try it again, but we were running ads to 
an offer which was a zero health check. And we ran the ads, we got a whole lot of interest, and then no one would share their zero file access with us. Mm. And that was because they didn't trust us. They thought it looked like a scam because it was a Facebook ad and then someone that they didn't know was wanting to see their financials. And that, that was a really... Yes. <laughs> It was a really interesting lesson for me in operating a, a bookkeeping and financial reporting business. Our clients need to trust us because they're sharing financial information with us. And seeing what happened with the Facebook ads, it just highlighted to me again the importance of trust and of your reputation. And and that then got me thinking about the the importance of trust with a brand, but also with your personal reputation. And I think that sometimes not enough value is, is placed on that or you don't guard it, guard your reputation as closely as you should be. And for me, that means things like keeping your word and doing what you say you're going to do. And I learned another lesson when I was going through the investment process with Simon where we talk through a lot of different scenarios and ha we have a quite a, a detailed shareholder agreement and contract between us, but it's still not possible to lock every scenario down, which means that really everything's built on trust and that we are both going to act in good faith. And if you have a, a strong personal reputation where people believe that you're going to do the right thing and do what you say you're going to do, then I think you can have those effective partnerships and the agreements with things like shareholders because you other people have trust in you. So my advice there for everyone is to really guard your personal reputation because it's, it's, it's crucial for these kind of relationships. Something else that you have mentioned before, which I identify with because it's something that I struggle with and I can see how, especially as an entrepreneur and running your own company, um, it's something that if it's not a, a natural uh, task or a natural way for you to approach things. It's something that you would definitely have to learn. Uh, I know you've mentioned before that you're kind of an over-researcher at, at some times, which I am too. And I think that just kind of comes with having an uh, analytical mindset. You kind of want to gain a lot of information before you make a decision, right? You don't want to find out after you made a decision that if one more page on the Google search would have told you not to do it, right? <laughs> but you've had to learn to make decisions quickly Go into a little bit about why that's important and how you were able to sort of override your tendency to research a little bit further. Yes, I had to <laughs> beat the over-researching tendency <laughs> out of me. <laughs> yeah, I realised it, it's important to make this, to be able to make decisions quickly when you're in business because there's opportunities and, there's again, there's only so many hours in the day and as a CEO there's a lot of decisions to make. And so I've had to retrain myself. As an accountant, you need to be analytical and manage risks and provide detailed advice where you have thought of different scenarios. But as a CEO, you're making decisions and you're not always going to have complete information. And sometimes it's more important to make a decision now rather than waiting two weeks until you have more information and then making the decision. And I think acting quickly is what allows you to take advantage of things like changes in the market and opportunities. And so to retrain myself, I, I had to get comfortable with that. And so a tactic, I think other accountants may have the same problem in wanting to have full information and spending too long researching, not enough time making quick decisions. Mm -hmm. so, so a strategy that I use to get myself comfortable with that when I'm making a decision is to really look at what, what are the worst case scenarios and what are the risks with this decision. And if I can mitigate those risks, then let's move quickly. So I'll give you an example. We were, uh, Michael in our team is experimenting with Pinterest. And so I thought, well, what are, the, what are the risks with testing a new social media platform? And really it's just, is it gonna damage our brand? And if we could mitigate that risk through me giving him enough training on our branding and the way that we communicate with our audience, if we can mitigate that risk and I've got trust that he already knows the right kind of things to say, then I'm happy with him just to, run, to do an experiment and see how Pinterest goes for two months. Whereas if I had tried to research all of the different avenues with of, is Pinterest the right platform for us or not, we could have wasted a lot of time on that instead of just going to do it and then see whether it worked and then make a, another incremental investment from there. So we, that, that's a simple example. 
and sure. there's much more complex decisions than that. But the, I think the idea or the concept of that is still the same about, well, can you mitigate the risks that you're not feeling comfortable with and just go and do it and then learn from that? Yeah, so really it comes down to kind of quickly identifying what the risks are and just finding a way to either go around them or deciding that, you know, there's not something you can mitigate within those risks and so it's just don't even bother researching anymore because you're not going to do it, right? Yes, and come into that decision quickly. Quickly. Yeah. That's the key. That's the hard part. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, you've mentioned uh, earlier in the episode getting to the point where you uh, now had an investor. And even before that, but possibly, you know, now after that, of course, with investors, that's just, you know, a, kind of another checkpoint. You know, someone else is going to kind of keep you in check with what you're doing with the finances. But talk to me a little bit about balancing short term cash flow with long term growth, because before you ever had an investor, I mean, that was something you were doing extremely well. I mean, like you mentioned earlier, you didn't even have a real office until you'd been in business for a couple of years. But that's kind of one example. But tell me a little bit about um, the challenge of that and how you meet that challenge and what are your recommendations for people who are in that situation? It was very challenging because we didn't, we only put in $500 to the business at the beginning and then everything else had to be funded through revenue. And so it was a constant struggle and balancing act of what should we do with the cash flow that we had, knowing that, well, a better website would help us or hiring that team member who's a bit more expensive would be good for our long-term vision, but how are we going to pay for that now when revenue is at the level that it is? And that was a constant struggle in terms of trying to figure out what to prioritise and what to spend money on. And something that did help with that is that Ben and I were able to reduce our living costs, our personal costs, and and also within the business, doing things like not spending money on an office. We really we tried to be quite careful. Yes, we're accountants about what we were spending our money on and making sure that it was going into things that would help with long-term growth rather than things that, that weren't going to impact that. But from a personal point of view, also keeping my own living costs low and so I wasn't do, doing as many expensive overseas trips. I was trying to be really careful about what I was buying personally so that money that was available could actually help in, in growing the business. And, but I think for anyone that's bootstrapping a business, that's just going to be a constant challenge around how you balance. Growth requires resources of either your time or someone else's time or, or money. So it's, it's always will be a challenge. And, you know, you've mentioned before, I think, too, about kind of looking at the worst case scenario, which that's actually one of the ways when I'm trying to get myself to do things like make decisions faster. One of the things I try to do is go, OK, if I choose wrong, that's the worst case scenario. Right. And I think you mentioned before um, that that's something that you do with balancing, you know, short term cash flow and long term growth is kind of discovering what's the worst that can happen and then moving forward from there. Right. Yeah, exactly. So if we do spend money or invest money in this and then it doesn't work out, how is that going to impact the business and, and can we handle that? Mm -hmm. And if we can, well, then maybe that is the right decision. Or if that would mean that we can't pay the team, then, well, that's not a risk that we can take. Once we had the investment from Simon, then it meant we were able to ramp up the things that we could spend money on and, and invest in and make those decisions knowing that we had a cash flow buffer. But before that, it, we just couldn't make a decision it, it, that if it didn't work out, then we couldn't pay the team. Then that's not a decision I would be comfortable with. When you are so tied to the business where, like you said, you're even kind of changing your personal finances and reducing your living expenses so that you can continue to fund the business, how are you also at the same time, I know you said it was almost about two years before you took a real vacation and, and fully disconnected. How are you investing in yourself? Because as the CEO, obviously you have to be sort of the brightest mind almost of the company to make sure that the decisions you're making are the right decisions. It's hard to do that when you're not sleeping and you're not kind of taking care of yourself. So you manage to you know, invest in yourself, take care of yourself and still sort of reduce your own spend and really keep the book, the business, your priority. How do you do that? What's, what is that balancing act? How do you really achieve it? I think even though I wasn't able to take holidays or extended period of time off, I was still able to look at 
other activities outside of work that made me happy and being fit and healthy is important to me too. And so I was still able to schedule in. I wasn't surfing as much as I would have liked in the first couple of years of business, but I was still able to exercise or go for a run at lunchtime or, or do something. So I was still trying to exercise every day and also do do yoga. And uh, I'm not so good at meditation, but I do try and do that if I can't get to a yoga class. And so taking care of myself in that way. And then I was also just investing in my own learning. So I, I, I had managed teams before, but... Dean Ninjas, we're a team of 12 at the moment, and I haven't managed teams of that size. And also, I haven't been a CEO before in terms of being responsible for so many different areas of a business and needing to know a little bit about marketing, HR, risk management, and as well as all of the technical side of bookkeeping. And so I've done a lot of reading and over the last couple of years. I read a lot of business books. I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I also go to events where I can learn from other people that are either doing different things, which I can learn and bring back to our industry, or people who are on a similar path to me that are further ahead and I can look at look at what they're doing and learn from that. So I've actually invested a lot in my own learning in the last couple of years. And now as, as a team, I'm trying to do that for our team members too and give them opportunities to go to events. And also I buy them business books and give them resources that will help with their particular career goals. Absolutely. So you're growing your team kind of in your own footsteps, which is, you know, always the best CEO to have is one that's actually already walked the walk that they're telling their employees um, to walk. And so I think that is remarkable. And it, I, I always kind of forget that you're a first time CEO because every time we chat, there's this wealth of information and all of these steps that you've made the right way in ways that you've grown your business and even things that you've done like, you know, saying, okay, Facebook isn't for us. It causes a trust issue, which, you know, if you go to a marketing uh, conference, they're going to tell you, you have to be on Facebook, you know? Um, So I love that even though you're new, there are things you've kind of stuck to that, you know, this is what doesn't work for us. And that's great that it works for everyone else. It's not for us right now. And I'm going to stick to that and move on and make a quick decision to do something else that's more uh, appropriate for my clientele and my business. Moving forward, you know, you've, you're celebrating your, you've just celebrated your third year anniversary. You've grown year over year. You now have an investor on board. So you're able to kind of make some um, decisions that gives you a little more room for growth. And I'm sure that we'll see you continue to scale the business and grow. You're already an international company. How do you set yourself up for what comes next and what are you planning to move into from here? So my, my thoughts around this are from a, from a personal point of view. So this applies even to someone that's not in business, but is just trying to improve their professional career. And there's a Charles Darwin quote that I like that sums this up. I'm going to have to paraphrase because I can't remember it exactly, but it's something along the lines of it's not the strongest or the smartest that survive. It's those that have the ability to learn and adapt to Mm -hmm. and change to their environment. And I really believe in that with think everything's moving a lot faster than it used to technology is changing. And I think the skill to learn new skills and adapt is actually one of the most valuable and and I'm aware that the accounting industry is a great place to be right now there's a lot of change happening and it's it's exciting but I'm also aware that what I have with Beanages right now the business might need to move and adapt and Beanages might look very different in 10 years time and so I'm aware that I, I shouldn't get complacent and that things are going to change and I need to be okay that there is change and make sure that I keep on learning and adapting and also encourage the others around me to do that. And I think that advice applies to anyone, not just business owners, about making sure that you do continue to not just invest in yourself, but be willing to change and move with change. Absolutely. And we see so many examples of when when businesses especially are not willing to have that philosophy. When I was in sales, I used to kind of always say, you know, things are moving to a digital format and you have to be online. Of course, this was a long time ago when 
when we were just learning how to sell, you know, AdWords and things like that. And I always used the example of, you know, Netflix came along when these video stores were on every corner, these brick and mortar stores. And you'd go in there and you'd spend, you know, three or four dollars and you'd rent a video take it home and bring it back. And then Netflix came along and they started sending you DVDs in the mail. And it was an entirely different experience. Um, And now, of course, Netflix is also an international company. And I don't think anyone actually orders a DVD from Netflix anymore because you stream everything. Uh, But there were so many of these brick-and-mortar stores that just thought that was a ridiculous idea, that they were going to mail their movies out to their customers. And they all, you know, closed. And so many of the big brands in the U.S. went out of business as a result of not being able to change and adapt. So really important message message from you about that. I cannot believe we're at the end of an ep- another episode. Every time I talk to you, I just want to keep talking because there's so much I'm learning and you've done so well. And, you know, every piece of advice that you give us uh, from one episode to the next is valuable and something that we can literally put into practice today. I'm going to continue to work on making decisions quickly. Any uh, final thoughts as we wrap up the episode today? Well, I think... It's exciting that we've got to three years and I'm really grateful for all of the Bean Ninjas team. A lot of our team have been with us for a big part of that three-year journey now. And so I'm really grateful to have the team that I do. And yeah, I suppose my parting words are just a, a thank you to them. Awesome. And I'm really excited to get some of them on the podcast in the future, too. I think that'll be really fun to have a couple more folks from Bean Ninjas on. Thank you so much, Meryl, for uh, spending another day with me today good luck on your home renovations and hopefully you didn't give up too much surfing time to join me today but i look forward to our next episode great thanks that does it for this episode of the bean ninjas podcast i am your host elizabeth powers joined by my co-host meryl johnston and we just want to thank you for spending another few minutes of your week with us this week as always remember to check out the show notes we're going to link to all of the exciting things that we discussed in this episode like the dcbkk conference the dcx conference and the zero bookkeeping partner of the year award from 2017 when you've gotten enough of that information don't forget to stop into the bean ninjas blog at beanninjas.com slash blog meryl's done a lot of the writing on that blog herself over the years the past three years so make sure you check Check that out and uh, dig into the information there. When you're done with that, don't forget, come back here and join us again next week for another episode.